Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call the September 17th meeting of the Hudson Council to order. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Unfortunately, the mayor uh, has had a family emergency and will not be able to join us this evening. As president of the council, I will be taking his place. I will also be retaining my right as the sixth district council person uh, to vote on the issues that come up tonight. Uh, roll call. Mayor Birchall is excused. Alderperson, District 1, Morset. Here. District 2, Yakub. Here. District 3, Bernard. Here. District 4, Tewinkle. Here. District 5, Hoggett. Here. District 6, Banslow. Here. Are there any comments or suggestions from citizens currently present on any issue that is not on the agenda? And would you please give your name and address? Yes, uh, council members. My name is Roy Schoberg. I live at 1108 Vine Street. And I'm here to address a matter concerning our local library. I'll make this quick because I understand everybody's here and to speak on another very important issue that's coming up right away. But I'm speaking as a resident of the city of Hudson who has paid taxes on this, my city property for over a quarter century. I live in an old house that's celebrating its 100th year of paying taxes in this city. And oh yes, I happen to be serving my third year on the Board of Trustees, having been appointed by former Mayor Dean Knudsen to serve on the Joint Library Board. I come here today in response to action taken by this council on September 4th, exploring the possibility of selling the library building. First, a correction. I spoke with Barb Peterson, the president of the library, the very day that she had a conversation with Mayor Birchall concerning the library's interest in purchasing the building. Ms. Peterson did not say the library was not interested in buying the building. What the seven-person library strategic planning committee has always said is that the library is in no position to purchase the building. When the four municipal partners only fund the library at 60% of the county library required rate, while at the same time the city increases our rent, increases our accounting charges, and is unable to control the health insurance costs of our library full-time staff, who are all city employees, how can we afford to purchase the building when you are not even letting us pay the rent? The joint partner's financial support is so inadequate that the Hudson Area Joint Library ranks dead last in 2011 and 2012 among our 28 peers. The fact that the library was seriously underfunded and in violation of Wisconsin statutes was brought to light last February. Since then, many well-meaning attempts were made to address the issue. <coughs> now it's probably too late. Every city resident will now need to pay a county library tax in addition to the city library tax, and the added county library tax will provide no benefit back to our library. When Mayor Knudsen helped arrange for the acquisition of the library building, the pro forma called for an, a minimum increase each year of 3% funding for 2010, 2011, and 2012. Instead, the library received no additional promised support and instead needed to drain almost all of its cash reserves to keep the doors open. So if this city is interested in having the joint library buy the building, per Mayor Knudsen's plan, please increase the library's funding up to 70% to the county rate for 2013. We can then afford the rent and we can work on a plan to buy the building. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roy. Anyone else in the crowd? I'm Laura Gray. I live in Croyview Apartments on 2nd Street. And um, there are just a couple issues. I want to thank uh, the Public Department for putting the orange flags up here on 2nd Street for the kids crossing. 
because last week two kids was crossing and I thought they were going to get hit. I came up here and they put them up right away. So I want to thank you. Also, <coughs> my concern is Randy, uh, I mean, Marty's going to put one of those um, speed, yeah, uh, by Crabview Apartments. And are you going to do that this week? Should have already been out okay, thank you. Um, also, the parking on 2nd Street is going to be really bad this winter. And I was wondering if the city couldn't, for, the, for that, those four months or five months that the bridge is closed, if they can't change the parking on 1st Street and put parking even on one, the even um, number that night and the odd on the other side. This way there's only one, one side parking. And I also want them to check somebody's burning down below the apartment building. And last night we had to close all our windows and doors. I think they're burning garbage, and I don't know how to find out. So maybe somebody, the public, somebody can find out who's burning garbage, and we'd like that to be stopped. Uh, two nights ago, we had a bonfire next door to us, plus across the street, both on Myrtle, one on Myrtle and one behind me. So I called dispatch, and I, I didn't see the cops come, but I'm sure they did, because within an hour, the, both fires were out, and we're scared the sparks are gonna fly up on our building and start a fire. And I thought there was no burning ban. You are correct, there is still a burning there ban. There is, okay. Maybe they can issue something in the paper, I don't know. But if they do burn, then give them a ticket. Maybe they'll stop, I don't know. But I wanna thank you very much. Good evening, Council. This is Andrea Jorgensen from the Hudson Area Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Bureau. I thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. I'd like to invite everybody in the Hudson area and surrounding community to come join us this weekend, September 22nd and 23rd. We are hosting our annual Spirit of the St. Croix Art Festival. We expect 80 plus artists there this weekend showing the best of the St. Croix River Valley in the arts and uh, we will be staging live entertainment in two different areas down <coughs> at Lakefront Park. Uh, ac acoustic musicians will be out strolling. We'll have several uh, creative demonstrations by both artists and some of our local businesses available for people to participate in. A uh, very wide variety of children's activities will be uh, available for our community to um, participate in as well that are free. So we invite everybody out to enjoy the fall colors, celebrate the talent of our River Valley, and certainly come out for some brats and some great food. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Anybody else? All right, we'll go to the consent agenda items. To approve the regular meeting and <coughs> closed session minutes of September 4th, 2012. To approve claims for payment in the amount of $278,235.51. A detailed description is available in the clerk's office on request and is posted on the city's website. To approve the issuance of four regular operator's licenses for the period September 18th, 2012 to June 30th, 2014 and the issuance of two temporary operator's licenses to be used October 26, 2012 at the CCH Foundation Annual Wine Fest. Additional operator license application information is available in the clerk's office on request. To approve the issuance of a temporary Class B retailer's license to the Christian Community Campus Foundation Incorporated to sell wine at the CCH Foundation Annual Wine Fest from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. on October 26, 2012 at 1312 Wisconsin Street. To approve the issuance of a temporary Class B, Class B retailer's license to the American Cancer Society, Relay for Life to sell beer and wine at the Bras for a Cause block party from noon to 4 p.m. <coughs> on October 13, 2012 at the Gagnon Construction Parking Lot, 112 Walnut Street. To approve designating the following events as community events. Celebrate the Holidays Light Up Night, November 23, 2012. Celebrate the Holidays Candlelight Stroll. 
November 30th, 2012, celebrate the holidays Reindeer in the Park, December 1st, 2012, and Hot Air Affair, February 1st through 3rd, 2013. To authorize Off Consulting and Associates and SNN Land Survey to perform boundary survey work to retrace and restake the boundary of City Trail property from Vine Street to St. Croix Street at a cost of $3,500. To approve the issuance of a temporary Class B retailer's license to the American Cancer Society Relay for Life to sell wine from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. on October 9, 2012 at the Go Pink for Life fashion show at the Phipps Center for the Arts, 109 Locust Street. To approve the hot air affair activities for February 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 2013 as presented. To approve the request to close 2nd Street between Vine and Walnut Streets for the light up night parade on Friday, February 23rd, 2012 from 6.30 p.m. to 7.45 p.m. Can you pull that, please? Okay. Should be November as well. Pull it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> to remove, to approve the installation of a stop sign on the northeast corner of Ashbury Court at East Canyon Drive. To place on file the quarterly reports of the EMS chief and the w wastewater director and the monthly report of the finance officer and the September 11, 2012 minutes of the Public Utility Commission. That is all. Move for approval. Second. <coughs> Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 T. Winkle? Yes. Bernard? Yes. Morset? Aye. Yakub? Yes. Hoggett? Yes. Vanslow? Yes. The next item on the agenda is going to have a presentation order, which has been set up to discuss the topic. And before we do that, uh, I want to say that I know it's a very emotional issue. Uh, I can tell by all the people in the room. I can tell by all the emails I've gotten and the phone calls that we have all gotten. I just want to say that th th this whole group of people in this room is one community, and we're all working for the same objective, and that is to make our schools the best we can and also to make our city the best we can. I think we're all working towards that. I don't think we're fighting over that. I know we aren't fighting over it. We're trying to do the best we can to ensure that the city is the best place for everyone to live in, and we also want our schools to be the best for our students. We aren't opposed to this. There's, there's no opposition here, so we all have to do this together. There may be a lot of discussion. There may be a lot of disagreement on how we achieve that, but those are issues. They aren't people problems. We have no problem with any of the people involved in this process. We have no problem with the school board. Uh, we have no problem with any of the people on that board. And we have no problem with the people who wrote us emails and made phone calls to us. We expect it. And as a matter of fact, I th really am enthused that people are that energetic and that involved in this process. I think it says a great deal about the community and a great deal about our people. So as we go forward, I'd like to keep the word respect in mind, and we should all respect each other as we go through this. <laughs> okay, the next item is the application by, do I read this? Yes. Good. The application by Curlin Properties LTD for rezoning approximately 131 acres of property at 2200 Carmichael Road, former St. Croix Meadows Greyhound Racing Facility from B2 General Business District to PUB Public or Quasi-Public District, and to amend the 2009 City of Hudson Comprehensive Plan, 2030 Master Plan Map Land Use designation from general commercial to institutional, except for the area of the parcel designated Conservancy District, Ordinance Number 13-12. I would ask that the, that Denny, he's already ahead of me, so he knows where he's at. Just to uh, review the recommendation of the Plan Commission, Plan, Plan Commission recommends that the rezoning comprehensive plan amendment request be denied for the following reasons. Rezoning of the property will cause a financial hardship to the City of Hudson and its residents now and into the future on lost tax revenue. There's no guarantee that if the property is rezoned, the school will ever be built, and that is contingent upon the passing of a referendum. 
rezoning request is not consistent with the city's 2009 comprehensive and long range master plan. There are other viable, less costly alternative sites for a school building, one within the city limits already zoned public use, and one outside the city that the school district already owns. By denying the rezoning, the city is not denying the opportunity for the district to build a secondary school. And last, redistribution of traffic is a major concern and would cause havoc on the Carmichael Road I-94 interchange area. Thank you, Danny. Any questions? I asked uh, Pete that you represent the owners of St. Carmenta's property. <coughs> thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, members of council, for uh, the opportunity to address you this evening. Um, as, as Mr. Darnold has indicated, the Plan Commission has considered our request for rezoning and has denied it and made a recommendation to the Council that you also deny our, uh, our request for rezoning. We have, uh, in the interim, filed a request for a continuance so that we would have an opportunity to discuss these issues that have been raised by the uh, Plan Commission with members of the Council, City staff, uh, to attempt to reach a result which will have mutual benefit to all of the parties involved, the owners, the school district, and the city. Uh, there are means of addressing the loss of the tax revenue in the commercial property in the city. For example, the owner would be willing to sell less than all of the acreage to the school district so that there would be adequate acreage for the school and still some acreage left as commercial, potential commercial development. The owner would also be willing to escrow some money from the sale proceeds to be paid to the city over the next several years to offset the loss in tax revenue to the city. The owners recognize that the city needs the tax revenues. We're willing to work out a solution to provide those revenues for a period of time, recognizing that the lost $25,000 approximately in annual revenue to the city will be far exceeded in a very short term by new construction and development within the city, some of which is already underway, such as the new construction of the professional office building by the hospital, the new construction in Banterra for new storefronts, the 13-acre site at the former Visitor Information and Travel Center, which will soon be developed, the Uline project, and the new construction just started in the St. Croix Business Park East. Additionally, the just recently completed construction of Walgreens and the new hotel and Banterra development all will increase the tax revenues by well more than the $25,000 annual lost revenue. The owners would be willing to contribute to the lost revenues for a few years while those new projects are being completed, so there will be no loss in revenues. As well as agreeing to keep some acreage as commercial for future commercial development or possibly having some zone for multifamily use. Obviously, the school district would have to agree to this, but we believe that the terms of the purchase agreement are subject to being modified with the consent of the school district. So these are possibilities. We believe they're real possibilities. The school district has some of their own ideas that I believe will be presented to you this evening. The bottom line is that we're willing to work with you if you're willing to work with us. We just need your input on how to make this happen. The owners and the school district are committed to make this work. We believe that we need an opportunity to vet ideas and discuss proposals to make this work for everyone. I ask you not to lose sight of the fact that the City of Hudson voters approved the referendum to build a new secondary school on this site by a 58% affirmative vote. These are the same voters who elected you to office. Your constituents want this to happen. The owners want this to happen. The school district wants this to happen. We're asking you to work with us to make it happen for the benefit of Hudson and the entire school district. We believe granting a continuance to allow for dialogue and discussion will lead to a resolution of any issues that you might have. 
I also ask you to consider that it was the city of Hudson by your predecessor councils that approved this property as a dog track and later to be operated as a casino. We're not asking that you accept responsibility for the failed dog track business or that the casino was never approved by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but we are asking you to accept some responsibility for the use of this property going forward. Would you rather have a new school in the community drawing in new families and new businesses growing up around it and greater retail sales and lodging revenues, which it will generate? Or have an eyesore that continues to depreciate in value and deteriorate over the next 10 to 15 years until the property might sell in a blighted condition? I also remind you that we have been trying to sell this property for over 10 years without success. That is clear evidence that it is not a desirable site for commercial usage. The owners also met with the city staff in 2009 to discuss the use of this site. It was then Mayor Dean Knudsen who suggested this property would be a good fit for a school and recommended we talk to the school district about it. That suggestion is what precipitated discussion with the school district that ultimately led to a purchase agreement and ultimately to the referendum which was passed in our request for rezoning. <coughs> rezoning to build a school on the site will improve its desirability for some commercial growth in the area as well as put the property to a use that benefits the community in the short run and the long run. We need to discuss all our options with you as a council or with representatives of your council to, uh, uh, to uh, determine if we can work out our, uh, a resolution to, our, to your concerns uh, with the rezoning of this property. We are requesting a one month continuance in order to be able to do that. We want you to help us put together a plan that benefits the property owner, the school district, and the city. We have presented a plan. There were problems raised. We address many, if not all, of those problems, but there were still concerns. We want to resolve them. We hope you do too. It's the intent, uh, in the interest of efficiency to all the parties, including the city, we don't want to propose another plan and go through the whole process only to have other issues raised and be turned down again and then possibly going through the same process with another plan only to be turned down yet again. It is in everyone's interest to sit down and discuss this to a resolution that will work. You tell us what we need to do and we'll do our best to make it happen. Work with us, please. Grant is a continuous continuance and tell us how you want to discuss this to a resolution. It's my understanding the mayor indicated his support for a continuance to be able to discuss this further, although as you know he's unable to attend the meeting here this evening. In the alternative, we of course would ask you to approve our rezoning request over the objection of the plan commission, but we're willing to present those same arguments again to you as we present it to the plan commission if necessary but we'd also request the continuance to do so at a later meeting if you deny our request to continue the matter for dialogue and discussion. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Mary, would you like to? President Van Vanslow and council members, uh, we extend our, um, we're very sorry about Mayor Birchall and his um, emergency and we wish him the very best. I think President Vanslow, your sentiment that you stated in the beginning um, is shared by the school district, certainly. Making the schools the best we can and certainly making the city the best we can. And I hope in my remarks that you'll see that we share those same sentiments. In 2010, the Board of Education began work on a secondary long-term solution to middle school and high school enrollment that was growing beyond capacity after putting it on hold during the most difficult years of the recession. Two years later, the St. Croix Meadows site has been identified as the best solution for a future secondary school and the voters approved a referendum for its purchase in April. 
Finalizing that purchase requires rezoning of the property from B2 to public by the city. Last week, the Board of Education certainly was disappointed in the Plan Commission's decision to recommend against rezoning the property. Since that time, the district has considered the two primary concerns that we heard identified by the Commission, namely the loss of tax revenue and the loss of commercial property. The district has discussed this with the St. Croix Meadow owner's representatives, as you heard um, Pete Seguin talk this evening, and believes that there are solutions available that can address the city's two concerns and also provide enough acreage at the St. Croix Meadow site for a large secondary school in the future. We ask for time to explore together a solution of mutual benefit to all parties. As an example, we heard at the Plan Commission concern about the potential loss of $23,000 per year of tax revenue to the city of St. Croix Meadow is rezoned public and becomes tax exempt. Coupled with this is the concern about adequate funding for police protection because of the city's budget caps imposed by the state. The city and the school district currently partner to provide a police school liaison position at the high school which is jointly funded. 67% by the district and 33% by the city. Both entities benefit from this position. The district is ready to take over the full cost of the police school liaison position, funding the portion that the city now pays at an estimated $35,000. The amount more than covers the current $23,000 property tax loss from rezoning St. Croix Meadows and removing it from the tax rolls. The Board of Education has already committed to approximately 10 acres of the site for city use or development. We heard that the city has interest in identifying a location for a public safety or public works facility. As another example of ideas of mutual benefit to the city, um, a mutual, mutual benefit to explore, excuse me, the Board of Education is willing to discuss a substantially reduced lease of this acreage to the city for multiple years in the future in exchange for a partnership agreement that includes student internships. The city may be more interested in commercial, business, and or residential development of this parcel. Using a specific development scenario, Stantec has estimated the tax revenue that could be generated from the 10 acres alone. With three acres developed as commercial, and seven acres as multifamily, the tax revenue for the city is estimated at $65,000. I'll probably say that one more time just yeah, in can case. Can you do that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> With three acres developed as commercial and seven acres as multifamily, the tax revenue for the city would then be estimated at $65,000. A smaller parcel like this, 10 acres, is more attractive for development than the entire 130 acres that is likely to require building demolition and site development costs that are extensive and certainly more difficult to finance. What acreage and for what purpose are areas of discussion and potential agreement? Along with the owners, the district requests the opportunity to work with the city to help address the loss of tax revenue concerns that have been raised and to provide benefit to the city more benefit than extending the number of years that the St. Croix Meadows property remains vacant, deteriorating, and providing <coughs> minimal benefit on the tax rolls. The Board of Education supports the St. Croix Meadows owner's request for a continuance to give representatives of the city, the school district, and the owners time to work toward a collaborative solution that will serve this community well in the years to come. The school district is committed to working with the city to transform this deteriorating property into a community asset of which we can all be proud. A redeveloped property that is an example of governmental entities working together, like what was accomplished in Burnsville, Minnesota, where a former shopping mall became a public school, and in Anoka, where a previous factory site became a public school center. The district restarted the process of finding a long-term solution to the growing enrollments at the middle school and the high school two years ago. Most of our community understands the need that exists. Hudson Middle School has the largest 6th, 7th, and 8th grade population, student population in one school in the state with over 1,300 students. 14 teachers teach on carts this year, 
and we're forced to use three classrooms and the gym in the adjacent Hudson Prairie Elementary School for additional middle school space. The high school has reached its capacity, is limited by the lack of space the common areas, uh, in the common areas to serve the present student population. And we already have program limitations. Higher class sizes are destined to move into the high school. We can't wait much longer to solve this growing problem. This, this is a problem that we share since both the city and the school district have made Hudson a great place to live, to work, and to learn. The need for additional space for learning is now. In his September 13th letter to Board President Tom Holland and the owner's representative, Attorney Pete Seguin, Mayor Birchall stated, and I quote, the city of Hudson stands willing to negotiate a resolution to which all parties can agree, unquote. He affirmed his support for the continuance this weekend during a phone conversation and told me he had planned to make a statement about it at the council meeting this evening. I implore you to support St. Croix Meadows as a future school site and work with us to find a solution of mutual benefit. Please support continuance or support rezoning the property now for public use. Thank you for this time. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Laurie, I believe you've got a presentation you'd like to mm -hmm. make. I do. Uh, first of all, I just want to um, thank everyone who's here and is showing so much interest in this um, issue that's before us. I know there's a lot of people um, tuning in at home. Um, without a doubt, we've gotten, I've gotten more input on this issue than any other issue in the five years, almost five years that I've been on council. Um, one thing I appreciate about this body and have from the very beginning is we have open debate, we have lively debate, um, we take a lot of comment from the general public, very open comment, I might add. Um, you know, we sometimes have heated discussions, but I think in the end, um, in general, people feel like their viewpoints were heard. And um, Brian, you can, you can shut that off for now, if you would, please. Um, generally, uh, um, people's voices are heard, and um, the best outcomes are usually a result of that debate. I think it's important to talk about how we got here. And um, if we think back, it was October 3rd of last year that the school district went into closed session and they had a special meeting and voted to go to referendum um, for the purchase of St. Croix Meadows. It's important to note that the City Council and the Plan Commission were not part of that discussion before that decision was made or even soon after the decision was made. Um, there was no collaborative discussion about partnership at that point, um, though it might have been a good place um, to start. Um, but because the school board voted to go to the, um, to the voters first, to go to referendum first, that didn't eliminate or negate the need for this debate to happen. This debate had to happen, but it was delayed for a year. Um, you might remember back in March, um, we were approached by the school district to zone contingent on passage of the referendum. The school district learned at that time it is not the city's practice to rezone in a contingent fashion uh, for anyone. It was not a special exception that we made and said we wouldn't do it for the school district. We don't do it in general. That's something that also could have been learned a year ago. Didn't have to wait till a month before the referendum. On April 12th of this year, the plan commission met. It was nine days after the referendum vote and the plan commission was ready to make a vote that night. It was the school district that requested an extension. They asked for one more month um, at that time, the plan commission asked uh, quite a few questions that they would like answered since the school was um, planning to go back and do additional research. Um, the one month became four months, and I understand it was, a, it was an extensive amount of work, and we appreciate all that went into that report. But we're here tonight six months after the referendum, and it's not the city that has delayed this decision. Um, the plan commission voted down this rezoning request unanimously. And I would just ask my fellow council members that if by extending the decision further, we are simply avoiding the inevitable. Um, I've been asked by a lot of people, I mean, one resounding question has been, haven't the voters already spoken? 
Yes, the voters spoke on the financing of this purchase. They voted on information that was provided by the school district, which did not address the need for rezoning or the lost revenue to the city. The question we're being asked as a council is a completely different issue. It's on a completely different contingency of that purchase agreement. It's rezoning. Um, because the district secured financing from the taxpayers does not in any way obligate the city to rezone the property in a manner that is a major deviation from our city's comprehensive plan. In the April 12th plan commission meeting, the property owner's attorney, Pete Seguin, said, and this is a quote, um, the referendum, of course, does not constitute a mandate to rezone this parcel for this purpose. The decision to do so will be up to the city council. So we're not voting on whether or not there are space issues in the schools. We're not voting on the need for a secondary school, the type of school, whether it'll have an Olympic swimming pool, whether there'll be a football field. We're not voting on any of that tonight. We're simply voting on rezoning. Comprehensive plans are put together to provide just that, a plan, a strategy, a structure. This governing body will change. <coughs> There's no question about that. And that's why we have a comprehensive plan in place in part is while this body changes, there needs to be a structure, a framework for the city to base future um, development decisions on. Um, we need to have a balance in our comprehensive plan of residential areas, parks, retail, commercial, industrial, um, and yes, public purposes. Um, and we have areas in the city that have been designated public. Have changes been made to the comprehensive plan? Absolutely. They've been minor changes for the most part. One that comes to mind is the, the former library at 911 4th Street. It was previously zoned public. It was brought onto the tax rolls. And Denny, correct me, it's now zoned office or light. Yeah, I made a mistake. It's zoned Central Business District. What was that? Central Business District. So it was one building, basically, and um, we took into account the fact that changing that zoning was not going to greatly impact the area. It was going to generally be an asset to the downtown and bring it back onto the, the tax rolls. We only get um, property taxes. The only way we generate revenue from businesses is when they come here and they build. I, th I sometimes think people think if they, if they pay a lot of sales tax because they shop in the city, somehow the city gets that sales tax. That 0.5% in sales tax that you pay, it goes to the county. And I, it may come as a surprise to all of you, but they don't share it with us. Um, so the only tax that's generated is when buildings, when businesses come and they pay property taxes. My third point um, is that the city is already paying what I believe is more than its fair share towards school infrastructural costs. And I'm gonna give some concrete examples. Um, you know, I think one thing that's been frustrating for me and maybe for some other council members as well has been with somewhat of a general, um, I don't know if you'd call it a lack of, of sensitivity or uh, maybe an, a lack of understanding of um, the significance of this request. It is a major uh, deviation from our comp plan. Um, the city has been a longtime loyal partner with the school district. I think that's indisputable. Um, if you stop and think about it, and I stopped and crunched some numbers, 86% of all the students in the school district attend a school within the Hudson city limits. Only North Hudson Elementary and Holton Elementary are outside of the city limits. The district is large geographically, but most of the students attend schools within um, the city. And as hard as this may be for some people to, to hear, it does put a burden on the infrastructure of the city and it is the city residents who pay for that extra burden. And I wanna give some examples of this. Um, Brian, if you could um, bring up the first slide, please. I um, currently chair Public Works, and we have a wide range of uh, road projects going on, some large, some small, um, but it occurred to me how many of these actually um, are adjacent to our school system. Um, the first one I would uh, bring up is... John, need to switch something? Yeah. John, could you switch it over to the computer, please? The first project I would bring up is the Carmichael Mill and Overlay Project, which I think a lot of people were, were glad to see get done. Um, I'll tell you, um, Randy, you pushed for this, and um, I appreciated that. Um, 
we made sure that that got done before the school year started. And I think as a result, it, um, it limited the bidding that we had to some degree. And, um, but it was something that we did as a public works committee to make sure that we accommodated the school district. The cost of that project to city residents was $164,000 borne completely by city residents. So some of you in the township who are appreciative of that Carmichael Mill and Overlay project, you might find a city resident who's sitting near you and thank them. Um, complete reconstruction of Grandview from Vine to Ash. You, some people might say, well, that's a residential area. Um, it's an area that's used by, a, it's used a lot by high school traffic. People trying to get in um, the back way there. The cost of taxpayers of that project is $444,000. When Wisconsin Street is completely redone, um, and that leads directly to the high school, the total cost to city taxpayers will be $750,000. And then when we look at complete reconstruction of Vine Street from 2nd to 9th, um, again, main thoroughfare in the city absolutely contains, you know, carries a lot of residential traffic, but carries a lot of traffic to the, to the high school, to the middle school. $2.85 million, and that will be borne entirely by city residents. So what does that mean when I say, you know, there's a greater burden on city residents? What does that equate to? And if you could go to the next slide, please. I took just a generic $200,000 home. That was a figure that I think the school district used. Um, and looked at property tax bills throughout the district. I sometimes think people lose sight of the fact that there's a pretty wide range of property tax burdens throughout the school district. Um, I'll mention something else. A $200,000 home is really out of reach for a lot of people in the city. It's completely out of reach. And a $200,000 home is extremely difficult to find in other parts of the district. I found two in the town of Troy that sold in the last year. Um, so if we look at um, those tax bills um, for a $200,000 home, in the city of Hudson, you would pay $3,400 annually. North Hudson, if you put the home up there, it's $3,100. If you move the home to St. Joe Township, it's $2,800. Township of Hudson, $2,700. Town of Troy, only $2,400. <coughs> so it's a $1,000 difference for a city of Hudson resident in that $200,000 home. What is that? It's almost $100 a month. For some people in our district, that's not a lot of money. For other people in our district, that's groceries, that's gas money, that's saving for their child's uh, college education. It's significant. Um, so if we could look at the next slide, please. Um, and this is just a, a different depiction of, of the, the percentage difference. So Troy's uh, property taxes are 29% less than the city. 20% less in the town of Hudson, 18% in St. Joe, and 9% less in North Hudson, North Hudson Village. You can see there's a wide range of property taxes throughout the, the district. So when I say there's a little bit of a lack of sensitivity, it's because it's hard to hear from people who experience um, taxes differently than city residents do. Next slide, please. This was pretty surprising. I expected there to be a difference in median household incomes, but I didn't expect it to be quite this large. This um, data is taken from the Census Bureau. And if you look at the uh, median household income in Troy, it's almost $110,000. Same thing in the Hudson Township. Um, St. Joe Township, almost 88000 North Hudson, 81000 And in the city of Hudson, um, $60,458. I point this out not to, to divide the district, not to be divisive or to, to I don't want to create envy or it, that was not the intent at all. It was to show that people in this district experience life in very different ways from an economic standpoint. Um, the city of Hudson has more low income housing, more multifamily housing, more young families, more elderly more individuals living in a wide range of assisted living settings than any other part of the school district. City of Hudson residents pay more in taxes and have a lower median income than the entire rest of the district. In fact, it's inversely proportional. We pay the most taxes and we have the lowest median household income. So with this request for rezoning St. Croix Meadows, the school district is asking those who earn the least and who are already paying the most taxes 
to support school infrastructure. They're paying more taxes in part because we support more school infrastructure to further restrict our ability to generate revenue. It's not surprising after looking at these numbers to realize that 60% um, of the yes vote came from outside of the city. Um, my next point is that our, our only hope for the city is growth. It's the only hope for tax relief is growth. Commercial growth, retail growth, um, industrial growth. Residential growth has been soft, as was reported um, in the school's report. And so when I talk about growth, what do I mean? Well, let's look at Uline. Um, why did Uline come here? They said at their ribbon cutting, many of you were, were there. They came here because the tax structures changed in the state of Wisconsin. Legislative changes have made our state more, um, more desirable place to do business. And so companies are coming here. They're building a $25 million facility. Um, they're initially going to have 200 jobs. I've heard there may be up to 500 when their final build out is completed. Um, some people say, well, they're Minnesota jobs. Hey, in this economy, we need jobs. Minnesota people need jobs. We need jobs here, too. Um, $400,000 in tax revenue is what we can expect um, from that. And you can go ahead and, and take that down. Um, so $400,000 in tax revenue, 100000 of that will come to the city annually. And 200000 will go to the school district. And so I just asked this question just for thought. If the school district had taken that site for their proposed secondary school, and it prevented Uline from coming into the city. You know, what sort of compromise could have been made there? Um, how could the school district have compensated the city for the loss of $400,000 in annual revenue, 200 to 500 jobs? Um, and essentially, that's what we're being asked to do with St. Cray Meadows. Um, my final point is this, that uh, rezoning of St. Cray Meadows is a major deviation from the city's comp plan. And it's not just the $23,000 right now, it's the forever loss of potential of that site. I think some people might argue that land is not, that property's not been for sale for 10 years. Um, and Danny, maybe at some point you could speak to some of the history there. You've been here longer, longer than I have. Um, there are other options for the school. I've had longtime school supporters approach me and say, we're concerned about these space issues, but the dog track is not the only place that it can be built. There are other possibilities. And I think that's why you saw the plan commission turn, um, turn the rezoning plan down. The site may be the school district's first choice. I speak only for myself in saying it would be my last choice. Commercial land of this sort is a non-renewable resource for our city. We've heard a lot about the school district's long-range plans for a 21st century education for our students. And we share your concern for um, the quality education that we all expect of our schools. But I would say that the city also has long-term goals of taking care of our aging infrastructure. And we have significant aging infrastructure in our city that needs to be addressed. We'd like to continue providing quality parks, roads, snow removal, fire, EMS, and police <coughs> service. We'd like to continue providing our residents with clean water and a sewer system that has minimum impact on our beautiful St. Croix River. We'd like to continue funding our library, our municipal court, and many other important city functions while keeping taxes in check and making Hudson an affordable place to live for individuals of all income levels. In my role as a city council person, I need to look out for the long-term economic health of the city and affordability for all our residents, young, old, those with children in the schools, those without children, those who've lost their homes, those who've lost their jobs, those in low-income housing, and those in a variety of assisted living settings. The residents of the city of Hudson already have both the highest tax burden and the lowest income, median income in the school district and we contribute the most to infrastructure support of the schools. This major deviation from our long-term comprehensive plan would unfairly and forever penalize City of Hudson residents in a way that cannot be compensated for that I can think of. I'm optimistic that that site will be developed at some point in the future and that we will look back and we will be thankful that we stuck with our comprehensive plan. 
We've heard all, of all the great things that will be gained by a school at the St. Croix Meadows site, and I would propose to you that the long-term academic goals of the district will be achieved whether the school is built there or in another location. Community pride will be realized regardless of where that school is built. And it is for these reasons that I will be voting no this evening um, to the request for uh, continuance, and I will be voting no to the rezoning of St. Croix Meadows property. Thank you for your time. Could we ask that you not withhold the applause until we get at the end, please? Thank you. <clears throat> All right, are there other council members who would like to make a statement? I have a comment. Uh, I want to thank everybody, too, for the uh, emails and the phone calls that I've received. Uh, I think it's great everybody's participating in this uh, show of democracy. As I followed the debate on whether or not to rezone the St. Croix Meadows property from B2 designation to a public designation, I can't help but hit on a few points that have helped me make a decision. First, having read the CSM rezoning analysis prepared by Stevens, Hoffman, and Stantec, I would question each of the presenters at the Plan Commission's meeting on September 6th to be less than credible and more so pushing their contractual agreement with the school district's direction and their philosophy of suggesting that they have prepared in the report is what is best for the city of Hudson and its taxpayers. They're simply not concerned about the general well-being of the financial impact it would have on the families across the city of Hudson if we took that parcel off the tax rolls. Their main concern is hitting the school board's directive and goals while making sure the billable hours are paid on time for each firm. To think this was an unbiased report is irresponsible thinking at best. Second, where is common sense in this issue? The refer referendum that took place in April, less than half the eligible voters in the city of Hudson only voted for passing the referendum. That number does not reflect the clear majority of the 7,800 eligible voters in Hudson. How does it make sense to have over 70% of newly acquired licensed 16 through 18 years old or bust drive to the opposite side of where they live north of I-94 to get to the school? It doesn't make sense. Where would the sense of community be without the walkers, the bikers, the skaters, etc.? Just how safe would it be to send 70% of our children across an already congested and overcrowded road? That's not common sense. Does it make common sense to take one third of our, the city of Hudson's buildable commercial property off our tax rolls? No. No one has more to lose than the city of Hudson's taxpayers. Comments made at the plan commission meeting again when the presenter suggested that the St. Croix Meadow property would not be developed anytime now or in the near future doesn't make sense. Please tell me where you folks have your crystal ball. The property has not been for sale until just recently, June 2011, I believe. It's not been 10 years on the market, as some have suggested. I think a professional firm could see great potential in this parcel as a whole or divided, which is an option. To suggest that these people know what will be best for our community and where to put something is naive at best. Being a lifelong resident of this great city, I reject the idea that a 62-page report that was created for the school board by three paid consultants know that this site is best placed for the school is an insult to this Hudson community. Not one of the many questions asked by the plan commission members were answered, not one. Not even the fuzzy math equation on page 25 or the chart 5.1.3 in that report asked by the mayor could be answered by the school district's <coughs> financial officer. The report is troubling at best. We as a council would be rejecting our fiduciary responsibility for accepting this rezoning proposal and take this parcel off the tax rolls. The voters were misled and misinformed. There's other land owned by the school district. Other options do and still exist. If the voters were given all the facts and information that the council and the plan commission had from the school board, my guess is the vote would have had a different outcome. Some voters thought they were getting a new high school for $9 million, which is not the case. It's for the land only. Voting to take the St. Croix Meadows property off the tax rolls for the school district doesn't even guarantee the school would be rebuilt. 
Another referendum for at least 40 to 90 million would have to pass to build and operate the school. We all see the need for additional space. We all agree we need to build. But I cannot agree to where it is to be built. There are other options. Two weeks ago, the Hudson Star Observer, volume 158, number 23 of their paper, two weeks ago, I believe, ran an article about the Hudson School District's ACT scores. Our children scored number one, and that's great. And I applaud the, til the children, the teachers, and the administration for providing the environment for these superior results as the ACT scores. However, it leads to a question. Was it the physical building that produced the ACT scores? Or was it the teachers and the environment they created that our students achieved this great accomplishment? The teachers, not the building, and surely not a sports complex is the reason they achieved those scores. I know, and I would be happy to work with the school district on a new site, but one that does not conflict with the city's master comprehensive plan and takes valuable property from B2 land designation to, the land, to public land designation. Thirdly and lastly, I would be remiss if I did not touch on the tone of this issue in regards to the rezoning request by the school board. During my deliberation, I kept coming back to my 14 years on the Hudson Noon Rotary Club and what our motto is and what we recite before each meeting. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? We'll build goodwill and better friendships and will be beneficial to all concerned. And I think we as a community and as individuals, individuals elected or not, have to answer these four fundamental points that I try to follow every day in business and in my personal life. From watching and listening to people, I cannot see this model holds true to this rezoning, rezoning request. I have to say this issue, along with one other issue, has been more vitriol and disrespectful than any other issues that I've seen with my eight years of sitting at this table. We, the Hudson City Council and Hudson School Board members, are, set, are to set examples of nonpartisan leadership, leadership that fosters the strength of a strong community for our children to follow now and into the future. Let's agree to disagree and respect each other's opinions. Let's work together, lead by example, so that the very children we're fighting for can respect and follow in building a strong community we call Hudson. Thank you. <laughs> and again, I ask, please, if we could not have the applause between each speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Any other council members? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a comment since I feel like we're coming out of order in some things here, so I'm just going to state this. Uh, um, I've already made my vote as a plan commission member, so, um, and as a plan commission member, I feel compelled to explain that our job is to work with our community development director, Denny Darnold, and to plan out the various areas of the city limits as well as look for potential areas where the city may expand. With that being said, we are also charged with the zoning of such areas. We work on the comprehensive plan that is required by the state. This plan by law is not only handed into the state, but also the school, districts upon, the school district upon completion. Neither the camp plan commission nor the city council are to determine whether or not the city is in need of another school, let alone where or how to build it. But we are charged of creating but we are in charge of creating a proper balance of commercial, residential, public, industrial zoning, et cetera. Denny has been our community development director for the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years, Denny? 27 years. Um, he has worked for many hours to design this city and, and to have that proper balance. So while we may not be the experts per se, he may not be, while we may not be the experts per se, he certainly is, and in his, and in his opinion is always, and his opinion is always taken with high regard. Um, if Alan could be here tonight, which I'm, sh I'm sure he would, he would be, as public servants, we, have char we, have, we are charged to serve the city of Hudson. However, first and foremost comes our family, and when a family emergency arises, that takes precedence. The beauty of a weak mayoral system is that we are a governing body that can take action without the presence of our mayor. With that said, I'll make a motion to deny the continuance and continue forward tonight with whether or not to rezone the St. Croix Meadows. I'd like to be able to speak before we get to that, if that's okay. We can do that. We could have a second if there is one and then have discussion either way. I'll second it so you can, for okay. discussion. So you're gonna second Mary's proposal? Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion and a second and now there's further discussion. <coughs> I see you have notes. Do you want to go? Or? You go. 
Okay, um, first I'd like to thank everyone who has taken time to provide their uh, input via vote in the referendum, by phone, through emails, and face-to-face -face conversations. I know everyone's taken a great deal of time and has spent many hours contemplating their position. Uh, I think I lay awake at night uh, thinking about this and be glad when we're moving on here. Uh, the will of the voters. I believe that those that have voted to rezone this uh, St. Croix Meadows property are aware of the potential impacts to our city. I'm not generally inclined to compel to go against the will of the voters. That being said, we are still bound as council members to at least consider the intent of the people and weigh that against the needs and long-term interests of the city of Hudson. So what's at stake for the city? At a very minimum, we are currently receiving about $25,000 a year from our current property owners, I believe it's 23,000, as been previously stated. Based on Denny's estimated land values and projections, there's a conceivable loss of revenue uh, to the city of about 150 to 310,000 per year if the property were to be commercially developed or developed as light industrial or a combination of the two. However, in order for this to happen, St. Croix Meadows would have, ha would have to be sold to an interested party or parties that will do something with the existing facility and redevelop the land for their commercial and or light industrial purposes. Opportunities have been scarce. The first opportunity that came along would have changed the property was a casino. I'm sure that uh, the room was divided on that as well. The city of Hudson and citizens chose not to allow that to happen. <laughs> uh, I've heard about really late night meetings on that one. Um, the second opportunity that is here is now is with the school district. Uh, is the site viable for a school as it currently stands? The school board has gone through its due diligence and made a co uh, case for the acquisition and development of the St. Croix Meadows property. Based on detailed studies of several sites, St. Croix Meadows has been deemed a viable site for school development. Some may not agree that it is the best site, but on paper so far it appears to be a better choice in many ways than the other three sites currently in consideration. Uh, as for transportation, 39 buses currently go to the current high school and in most high schools, most people don't get to walk or ride their bike. They end up driving, which is why I like, uh, 10, 11, 12 is kind of a preferred for that. Uh, excuse me, time is not necessarily on our side. This part of the process, acquisition of the property, is quite a ways down the road in developing a new school. Interest rates are historically low at the moment. The new St. Croix River Bridge will be coming in 2016 or 17. A new school is still five years out, even if we proceed today. Any delay will mean that a new uh, school will likely be done after the new bridge is built. For some, that may be significant. Uh, what happens if we don't rezone? Well, there will be no clear picture of what will become of the St. Croix Meadows facility. None of us have a crystal ball, as Randy says. In the past 10 years, uh, uh, if the past many years is any indication, not much will be happening anytime soon. The city will continue to collect its $23,000 a year. The school district will be faced with more difficult choices. After watching previous proceedings, it seems that there may be, uh, they may be back at square one, which could mean a significant time delay in future school development. No guarantee that they would proceed on any of the properties that they currently have. Current and future residents may start thinking about locating to other school districts. I received some emails in that regard. Stillwater, Woodbury, New Richmond, and River Falls all have nice new high schools. Uh, and we would be going against the will of the voters. So what happens if we rezone St. Croix Meadows? If we choose to rezone now, uh, at one point when I wrote this, it looks like we'd lose 25000 but if we uh, play with the school and we could, uh, I see 35000 in a police officer and 65000 in other commercial, that's $100,000 the way I see it on paper. Uh, there are ways to recoup these losses which need to be discussed further. The school district will be in a position to move forward with a new school, which is sorely needed in our school district. The people will get a new facility that will help stimulate new growth in our neighborhoods and with our vacant commercial spaces and other land that is available. School district res uh, residents would be able to rest assured that we have secured a known future. <coughs> Anything else is unknown. Rezoning supports the will of the voters. I am confident that the people have made a solid choice for the city of Hudson and for the entire school district. Rezoning is a known choice with public support. Not rezoning is making a choice for uncertainty and goes against the will of the people. Therefore, I support the people and believe it is in the best interest of the city of Hudson to support the rezoning of the St. Croix Meadows property to public or quasi-public. Kurt? Yeah, a couple of comments, Rich. Um, well, I feel that my responsibility on this council is to decide on whether or not to rezone St. Croix Meadows. It is not to decide to where to locate a school. 
I think it's okay that other options have been uncovered and discussed, but ultimately, I feel this council's job is to look after the comprehensive plan that is in place as well as the tax revenue generated within the city. I've heard that it's only 23,000, but at this point in time, 23,000 is more than we are able to remove from our budget. I firmly believe that the land will eventually lend itself to commercial development. It may not be retail, but commercial encompasses much more than retail alone. Uh, one final thing is that the referendum that was passed in April was to authorize the district to purchase St. Croix Meadows, uh, contingent on rezoning by the city. These are two completely separate issues that should not be tied together in my opinion. I guess um, my position on this, after looking at the volumes and volumes of information, uh, the referendum and everything that's gone into this, I, I, I like to approach things from a very simple standpoint. And there's only one question in my mind about making this decision. And that question is whether or not the property can be developed commercially or industrially. If this property cannot be developed, then I say, fine, let's put a school on it because we're not going to benefit any, any bit at all from that property. And so a school would be a good place for it. However, if it can be developed commercially, the, the opportunity costs of $556,000 a year in taxes to $1.2 million in taxes is somewhat overwhelming to me. Of that amount, the school district would receive $250,000 a year up to $600,000 a year in tax revenue if it can be developed. With declining state funding for education, declining federal funding for education, I don't know that I would be willing to sacrifice that opportunity. I don't have the answer to that question and it bothers me that I don't. Uh, so you're, I have to go with the best I can guess. I'd like to give that property some time to develop. I'd like to try to take the opportunity to capture that sizable amount of tax revenue for the school district and for the city. So we have a motion. Would you repeat that motion so we all understand it? My motion is, was not for the rezoning right now, it's for uh, um, the continuance and that what I said was I, I move to deny the continuance and continue forward tonight with whether or not to rezone St. Croix Meadows. Okay, so the the motion and the second was on the continuance and whether or not we we're allowing the continuance. Can I just speak to that sure. briefly? Um, Mary, you mentioned, um, I believe it was you mentioned the, the continuance of one month. Was it? No, I did that. Okay, it was, okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Seguin. Um, we are right in the middle of budget crunch time. I can guarantee you there is not going to be time for any sort of discussions. I know the mayor. Um, spoke to the fact that any discussions that would take place would take place in open meetings, in council chambers. Um, it's not gonna be representatives of the council, it's gonna be the council and the school board. Um, it's just, I realize that you just passed your budget. We are trying to squeeze blood out of, you know, turnips right now. So trying to find money for the city to operate next year. The timing couldn't be worse. So. My only point of saying that is, I don't see this happening in a month. So, I don't know what anyone else on the council is thinking. Um, and unless there's a, a significant plan change, um, I've heard some options about, um, you know, paying for the rest of the police officer. Um, I'm concerned about the just the long-term potential of that property. And I don't know that personally there's anything, any, you know, we'll give you this for that. I'm not sure there's any of that that I question in some part, and Catherine, maybe you could speak to the legality of some of these things, of them escrowing money and paying the city back. I haven't been uh, privy to their proposal, so I haven't looked into it. Nor have but we. the zoning issues and the issues, you know, that the city is considering are really separate from funding issues for a police officer and so forth. 
in my mind. There is something called payment in lieu of taxes. I have not looked into it. I think with the discussion that's been had and you're looking at a long-term revenue from a commercial property, you know, those aren't that what, what's been proposed tonight. But I agree that land use and other budgeting issues like the police officer are separate issues. I just can't see what it's going to hurt to even just consider any other financial adjustments that may be or may not be legal. And since we can only negotiate these in open council, um, you know, what's the harm in waiting another month? I well, just I don't see it. The seller suggested an escrow to escrow a land from the sale of the <clears throat> from the sale the eight, from the eight point two five million dollars sale. He would escrow some of that and give that back to the city. Well, that to me that's just taking one tax dollar bank account and putting in another tax dollar bank account. It's, it's still our taxes being shuffled from one account to the other. It's not, uh, I don't see the, the um, benefit in that, except instead of the, it going towards the, 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 the school, the, the taxpayers are still paying the same. It's not, I don't see the benefit in that at all. So that to me was, I think is a non-issue. Not to be argumentative, but I think when you put it in escrow, that's additional funds there outside of the sale that are not part of the taxable part of the sale. So I would see that as additional funds, not. Okay. So. Well, I, again, I'll bring up the point of we are in the middle of budget time. I and appreciate I mean, it's that. Just, it's not going to happen. Budgets are important, month, but this is all about a, this is a school. And I think mm -hmm. everyone here would appreciate a little more time, I think. Um, okay. I mean, it's been a year. And um, there's been plenty of time for discussion about partnerships and collaboration. Um, I'll go back to my concern for leaving that 130-acre zone commercial. That's really the bottom line for me. And so it's not about you know mixing and matching um, 10,000 here and 20,000 there. I, to me, it's not a. I'm finding a difficult. Um, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to imagine what that that middle ground would be. Um, so, but it still means it's possible to have middle ground. I mean, <coughs> we we tend to lack a little creativity when it comes to making deals. I I just like I said, if in a month it's over, then I'm sure that the school district would absolutely want it to be over in a month, no matter what. I think everyone needs to, you know, try one last thing, and if that's not going to work, well, then it's not going to work. But I I just don't see the point in, in not at least trying. It it doesn't settle well, John. Excuse me. John, I, I think Pete, we're kind of past the time point. And, and, and let me say first, I'm just to add a comment here. I certainly appreciate the school district and the owners offer to try to compensate us for the taxes. Unfortunately, the $23,000 in my mind is not the issue. It's the 556000 to $1.2 million that's the issue. $23,000 I'm not worried about right now. I mean, I can be worried about it, but I'm not choosing to be worried about it. I'm worried about the longer issue, and I don't see how we can compensate for 556000 to $1.2 million. And I don't, I don't know how we're going to come up with a plan to compensate for that. So we've got the continuous. John, you want to continue? I'm sorry. I didn't no, I'm fine, Rich. You're good. Okay. I, I mean, and I've, I know if people have received tons of emails. There's other property that we have currently zoned that we could rezone other things. I mean, it just seems like if we're not willing to go the extra mile, then really we've just kind of left it something on the table. Have we exhausted all possibilities? It just doesn't feel like it. It just seems like we're just saying, okay, we're done. And Can I, that's kind of hard to accept, to be honest. Okay, that's fair. I, I've had some interesting ideas thrown my way. Maybe some of you have too. I had someone today who lives in the township suggest that we rezone um, Newton Field to commercial. Mm, I had that one, yeah. I mean, we're talking, see, this is the problem, is we have a comprehensive plan for a reason. It's strategic. It's not, oh, you know, you're taking 10 acres here, well, we'll give you 10 acres over here. It's sort of insulting, I have to say, and I, for all the work that Denny's put into <coughs> long-range planning for the city, all the time and money that was spent on our long-range comprehensive plan, it's a little bit um, insulting 
to have people who don't even live in the city start telling us how to mix and match our zoning properties. And so when I hear ideas like maybe we could make Newton Field commercial, you know, it's it's kind of hard to Yeah, I hadn't heard that compute. one, so, so I, I hope you don't think I'm suggesting yeah, that. No, I'm not, <laughs> but I'm just saying those are some of the ideas I'm hearing floated, and I'm saying okay. I want that large piece of property, that 130 acres, to remain commercial. Not that I want people to, or the school district, to find 130 acres throughout the rest of the city and, you know, mix and match it. It's that parcel, it's that size of parcel. parcel. To, to piggyback on what Lori is saying, actually, the comprehensive plan, when it was redone in 2009 it wasn't done in one or two meetings I think it took almost a year of plan commission meetings to get this done and correct me if I'm wrong Denny it's longer more than a year okay more than a year with I don't know how many uh, public how many um, um, uh, times there was a public input was available um, so I mean if this is if this was suggested by a previous council to the school district to look at St. Croix Meadows, I mean, it maybe at that time would have been the right time to come to the plan commission and say, you know, we're, we might be interested in this site. Will you consider change, having this be public? But over a year of discussion and, and, and public hearings were put into this comprehensive plan. It's not done overnight. You know, hours and hours. So. I, I would only correct you on statement, in which it's, it's not the council that talked about letting this or the idea of the dog track becoming uh, a, a possible school site right. that was between the mayor and the, the, the administration the, the last council sure. didn't do that all right so. we have a motion and we have a second any further discussion here all those in favor aye, aye. aye. all those opposed no motion <coughs> passes five to one Vote no. Yes. Or Two no. No. Nope. Two voted yes. Correct. Right. Thank you. One no. Um, motion carried. Uh, we now have the. Without the continuance, uh, we now have the. Rezoning issue at hand. Is there discussion? Further discussion here. Are there any motions? I'll make a motion to approve the uh, rezoning to public or quasi-public. You'd have to have, You'd a, have to have a suspend the rules. I'm sorry. I move to suspend the rules. I'll second that. T. Winkle? Yes. Bernard? Yes. Morissette? Yes. Yaku? Yes. Hoggett? Yes. Vanslow? Yes. Now we've suspended the rules. We can move ahead. I'll move to approve the rezoning request from the Hudson School or er, Ordinance 13-12 to approve the public or quasi-public rezoning of St. Croix Meadows. Is there a second? No second. Without a section, the motion does not go forward. Any other motions? I'll make a motion to deny Ordinance 13 12, the request of, Saint Croix, of Croix Land Properties to rezone St. Croix Meadows from commercial to public, quasi public. Is there a second? Second by Randy. Discussion. If I can speak on why I'm making that motion. Yes, you can. The reason, you know, the reason we're here tonight is because, in my opinion, and I stated this in plan commission, um, be, frankly, because a referendum that happened years ago on UU to build a school failed. It passed, the, the land passed by about a 56% vote, the land purchase, but the school vote failed by about a 72% vote so, um, back in 2003. Um, and, you know, I, I asked the school board, you know, how much and when the new referendum to build a school would be and you know they don't quite know the answer to that yet and I think the best I could gather was somewhere around 40 million maybe higher um, history has dictated that there is no evidence to suggest that any such referendum would pass especially given the current economy um, at least in the city of Hudson so we are left with going out on a limb to rezone this land which very well may stay 
as is for the next 10 years and yet give us another, well, fr quite frankly, another UU. Um, so I think it would be irresponsible to rezone without any evidence that a referendum would pass, and that's why I'm denying, or uh, made a motion to deny rezoning. May I make a comment, Mr. Sure. Chair? Yes, um, our ordinance requires the city to council to issue written findings um, for the basis of any uh, denial of rezoning, and your issue sheet has the committee recommendation from the plan commission, so I would ask um, based on the committee yeah, recommendation, if you wanted to incorporate these yep. findings. Since I sat on the commi plan commission meeting, I'll say based on the plan commission committee recommendation. Okay. Is that okay with the seconder? Uh, Randy was yep. the second. Randy did second. Further discussion here. All right, we have. No, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I would like to. Um, a lot of comment that I've received from people in the public people who are interested in seeing um, a new school built or additions put onto the schools, they want this to be done. They want resolution. We've been, wait we've been waiting for a year to speak on this. When we were asked for the conditional um, rezoning in April, we weren't really asked, I'm sorry, in March, we weren't asked, will you rezone the property? The answer might have been the same as it is today. We were asked, will you contingently rezone the property? Um, I just wanna, you know, a lot of criticism has come our way as though we've been difficult, we've made the school district jump through hoops. Um, we've not been asked until now. And if I felt like there was some glimmer of hope within the plan commission, um, if there was a split vote, if I sensed that there was sentiment in this group that you know what, yeah, there's, there's some hope for some minor tweaks here and there, and then they'd be open to it, but that's not what I'm hearing. And so the logical side of me is saying, if this isn't going to pass, if it's not going to pass rezoning through plan commission or through the council, is not the best thing to, at this point, make a decision, let the school board move forward. The people who've suffered in this lengthy process it's the students in the school district. It's, it's voters who've been frustrated with the order in which things have taken place. Um, so I think it's really in everyone's best interest to make a decision and allow progress to continue in whatever direction that is. All right. Again, we have the motion and the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Motion passes five to one. I'd like to remind everybody that that is not a vote against any personal, any personal issues here at all. This is not a personal vote. Five minute recess, maybe. You want to recess? I take five minutes. No, let's keep going. What should we just keep going? We're going to have five minutes. You don't have to because there are people here. Yeah, we got. Let's let's. We're going to take a five minute recess while everyone clears out. And we can get some rest and. The uh, next item on the agenda is a request uh, of Russell. <laughs> request of Russell Evanson for a 90-day extension of liquor license for the Postmark Grill. Move for approval. I have a second. Yeah. Discussion? Questions? Russ is here. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thanks, Russ. Wish you. Best of luck. Looking forward to it. Um, I gotta get organized. Next item, consider policy for use of proceeds from the disposal sale of city property. This is Lori's. Oh, I brought this forward and um, we just made a um, recommendation at finance that we um, adopt some changes to our procurement policy so that when capital equipment is sold, such as vehicles, that it's all, it's treated equally across departments. So if it, capital equipment sold, that those funds go back into the capital equipment fund. Okay. You know, and I, I, I'm open to the idea of, you know, if Public Works sells $5,000 worth of capital equipment, I don't know if there's any way, maybe this will be an accounting nightmare, Neil, but if it can be tagged, 
you know, that's public works money, that it be used toward future vehicles. Um, it's just a way to keep the accounting clean, I think, and make sure that funds are used for the purpose in which they were intended. And Neil and I have some other changes, tweaks that we need to make to the policy, so we'll incorporate that in when we do that. So I guess I would make a motion that we pursue that procurement policy change. I'll second it. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Request to repair or replace building inspector's vehicle. Well, the Finance Committee made the recommendation to uh, uh, look at avenues to replace uh, the, uh, the existing car that I'm currently using. Uh, right now we're looking at about $2,700 worth of repairs to that car. Uh, so uh, the, the Finance Committee agreed to use some uh, ex excess permit revenue money uh, to replace that vehicle this year. Dave will be bringing back Dave will yeah, options for you at a future oh, okay. meeting. Is leasing an option at that? I wondered the same thing. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I'd like to see us get a low mile, low mile, you know, used vehicle, gets good gas mileage. How many miles do you drive a year? Um, when when I, I had a better handle on it when I was driving my own car, it's, it's usually about six to 8,000. In, in a peak year. So we'd be within lease? Yeah. We'd have to look at the, the lease rate first. Sure. Right. The other thing that was mentioned in finance is the possibility that it could also then be used if other administrative staff had a meeting to go to or something and coordinated it with David. Mm -hmm. So it could be used by other people as well if it was a more of a reliable vehicle than what he has right now. So the Proposal is for David to bring back some bring options, back some, bring back some, uh, options, some quotes. The, yep. the only concern I have about leasing is, you know, like today, for example, is on on a on a job site, you know, uh, gravel gravel roads and so forth. So the wear and tear on a on a lease return might be might be uh, prohibitive. And the other concern is it's in the parking lot here, on kind of unprotected. That could potentially, you know, lead to some issues too, as far as damage. Well, that's a constant payment. There's never a buyout. You know, it's never, you know, I mean, we could buy out, but just then tend to lease. I'm assuming was that you can get a newer car than every oh, yeah. three years, but then we're constantly paying. So I would, I would anticipate we could easily, uh, you know, drive it for 10 to 12 years okay. easily. Well, we need a motion and a second here to make this official. No, no, he's just, just going to come back yep. with information. Okay, so we don't need the motion. <clears throat> All right, your commission to go about doing your work. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, the uh, next agenda item is review bids and consider awarding contract for Lake Malibu Storm Sewer Project. We opened bid on the project on Thursday. We had three bidders. It was uh, Zappa Brothers was the low bidder at 153735 Our estimate during the technical study was $165,000 for construction cost. Um, also on this project, we have to access the site from the resident to the east of the project, and we've been in communication with him. He does understand that because we're starting so late, it may not be possible to restore his driveway or sod by the end of the year, but he understands it would be done in springtime. But we do want to get the channel repaired this fall so we can avoid any undermining or erosion with the spring <laughs> melt and runoff. I move we approve the bid from Zappa Brothers for, what was it, 153,635? 153,735. That. I'll second. It's with the understanding that there's an additional yep. 14,000, estimated $14,400 yes. for construction, inspection, shop drawing reviews, construction staking. You took your fees out, right? Oh, mine got tripled. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, motion in the second uh, discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those aye. Opposed? <coughs> motion passes. <laughs> I'm sorry. What, did you want to talk about the stormwater sewer? Well, I was just kind of wondering. I'm, I've been sitting here for hours and hours and hours listening to all this stuff coming through. And I was just wondering when it says this one's a high bid, is there any reason we don't hear all the bids or just. They're, they're in the. Because I, mean, I just got an issue with the way right. somebody oh. always gets everything. Just oh. All of the bids are posted on our website prior to the, so all that information is out there on the Friday prior to the council so meeting. Show the bids and all that information is out on the website. It's all public information. It's all public information. All public. That was actually the low bid too. That, that was, was not the, the high bid. bid. That was the lowest bid. Yeah, well, I was just kind of wondering where the lowest bid comes in, how close the other one is. Well, the high bid. I'll tell you what the high bid was: two hundred thirty-two thousand nine hundred and eight. So the, the bids were 157, 161, and 232. Yeah. And we're local. We try to stay local. I know the app is, but we always try to stay local. We're right. all possible. And this is a public bid, so anybody, this isn't us going out seeking quotes. This is a public bid. So anybody that's interested can come in and. Okay. All right. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Uh, next item review bids submitted for purchase of a three quarter ton public works pickup truck. Earlier this year, uh, uh, the city council approved uh, purchase of two uh, pickups for the public works department. Uh, earlier we purchased one and we were uh, waiting to see how the other projects came in. Uh, all of those projects came in under uh, projected cost. Uh, we would like to get another pickup approved. We did go out and get uh, RFPs, uh, Hudson, uh, Luther Hudson Chevrolet was low bid at $26,057. Hudson Ford came in at $26,500. I would uh, recommend that we accept a bid from Hudson uh, Chevrolet for the cost of $26,057. As other note, we have uh, sold three used pickup or older pickups uh, that we had in our fleet, and uh, we plan to sell another, per, uh, another pickup after we get this uh, <coughs> truck. Uh, our repair costs have been high. Uh, the oldest pickup we sold was a 1984 pickup and some of, couple of the other two were 1987s. Um, we feel that this is gonna be more efficient and we will help our operating budget for the repair costs. Move to approve the bid. Second. Luther. Oop. Sorry, Randy. Twenty-six thousand fifty-seven dollars. I'll second that. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion passes. Review bids and consider awarding contract for the WWTP digester mixing and SCADA system improvements project. Hope I got that right. Close. Uh, thank you. I'm Rob O'Connell. I work at TKDA in St. Paul. Uh, we recently finished a design, and last Thursday we bid on the subject project, the digester mixing and SCADA system improvement project. Um, I'll give a brief objective of the project. It's sort of twofold. The second half, the SCADA system improvements is just a general upgrade of your supervisory control system at the wastewater treatment plant. The first part of the project, the digester mixing project, is a, um, a project where we're going to improve the mixing of your primary digester. Uh, the objective of that is to is twofold. One, it will create a better uh, end product of your digested sludge so that you can, when you send it down to the Ellsworth Solids Processing Facility, the, the charges for that yearly will be greatly reduced after this project. The second portion of that, we will capture the methane gas that's gonna come off of the digested sludge and use it during the winter months to heat um, buildings at your wastewater treatment plant. Uh, as I said, we opened bids last Thursday. They ranged from a low bid of 867, 887. That was a um, firm by the name of Total Mechanical Systems out of 
St. Paul Park, Minnesota. And the high bid was uh, $982,000, which was um, submitted by a firm called Shank Contractors in St. Paul. Um, as I said to the Planning Commission, our engineer's estimate was a little bit lower than the, lower, than the low bid. It was about $800,000. Um, I was asked why that was, and, and right now we don't exactly know why that was. We bid it in two lump sums, so we didn't get an itemized unit cost bid. Um, there could be several reasons for that. A lot of contractors are very busy right now. We're also bidding the project at the end of the summer when maybe their schedules are already full. Um, although when I look at the, bid, the bids, I see no reason why the city shouldn't go ahead and award the contract to the low bidder total mechanical for their low bid price of 867 887 Thank you. Questions? Sure. Jim, either, you, either one of you, sure. um, can you address engineering costs? <clears throat> yeah, I can. We, the design, we, we already have a contract um, th with the city for design and construction. The design um, was a lump sum of $55,000. The construction is a uh, hourly not to exceed of $43,000. I believe it's $43,000 even, but there might be a couple hundred after that. It's about $43,000 for construction administration, um, construction observation, shop drawings, RFIs, project meetings, et cetera. Okay. Is that fairly typical? It seems high relative to the... Well, what is it out of, so it's about 5%. No. That's more than that. Not to exceed, we don't have to spend at all. Yeah, no, but it's like 10 percent. If I'm, it's like 10 percent of the. Oh, I'm talking this the construction cost. The construction oh, okay. costs less than four, less than well, about five percent of the uh, of the total bid. That's really not that high, considering there's construction observation as well. I'm surprised it's not higher, considering the scope of your work. Dealing uh, with, uh, it, it's a hazardous material. Well, it's um, it's it's an interesting project, but it's it's not a large project, so I think it's a fair price. And the funding for this will come out of um, DNR funds that we set aside so much money every year for, so in the sewer fund, so it's already there. Is that right? <coughs> Equipment replacement fund, and what's the other one? Future facilities. Future facilities. So it's fully funded. Mm -hmm. So it won't be on the also rates. there's a fifty five thousand dollar grant secured for focus on energy that applies to this. It's a reimbursement. Yeah. And uh, the project payback with the savings that uh, about Rod five, mentioned. About five years. Yeah, well about yeah, about six years. Yeah. We, we believe so you'll. It's a, it's a real good. <coughs> yeah, we'll, we believe you'll save about a hundred thousand dollars, give or take, every year in your processing fee down in Ellsworth with the new project. And then the savings from the heat. Wow. As well. The energy savings energy are, are small, savings, but yeah, there will be energy savings as well. <coughs> but the big one is the processing charge in Ellsworth. Do we have a motion? There is no motion yet. I move for approval. A second. Oh. The low the bid. Low bid. Oh, low bid. From total mechanics. My motions are always halfway done tonight, apparently. Sorry. <laughs> Jim, we do appreciate all that you're doing down there as far as energy savings. And we're starting to see that some of our investments in the city are paying off. Yeah. And so those are wise investments to make. We appreciate you guys being forward thinking. Thank you. Well, thank you. Mo motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next item on the agenda is a request to close Second Street between Vine and Walnut Streets for light up night on Friday, November 23rd, 2012, from 6.30 p.m. to 7.45 p.m. Okay, <clears throat> I pulled this off the agenda. Um, uh, as public safety chair, it's my responsibility to catch these things, and I missed the fact that the Stillwater Bridge is closing, or is closed. We had our meeting prior to the closing. Uh, we got a lot of um, pushback with the homecoming parade and so I just um, would ask that we can take it back to public safety there's still enough time to try and figure out an alternate way to to have light up night without affecting second street so I just like to move it, make a motion to send it back to public safety Second. I would ask that maybe and it's just an idea that it be that we consider having it on first street 
Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna look at it. They're not to cancel it. The, we're not gonna cancel gonna it. Cancel they're gonna Christmas. find a, no. We're not gonna cancel it. They're gonna try and redo an alternate route that they are happy with and bring it back to safety. I would agree. After homecoming, <laughs> yeah, just a background on that. As I mentioned, at finance, though, the homecoming grade was the permit was given a year ago, and sure. then I don't know, but still, a lot of things came up. So. Why was it given so far? Why did they we give they it so booked far that as soon as they have a homecoming date set, they have to get the state's approval several months in advance because it's a state highway. So the state didn't catch it either? Well, this, because I suppose at that point, maybe they didn't know when the still water, but okay. they might not have caught it either. But Because okay. we did get some, I did check with us. But we knew it was coming. I mean, we should, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I made a mistake. No, it's okay. So there's a motion to move it to public safety? Yes, that is my motion. Uh, was, there, was there a second? You yeah, second? I second. Okay, you have a second ready. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. October 6th, whatever that is, 4th? October 4th. Our next item, discontinue allowing storage of dinghies on public property and inform sailboat mooring permit holders that all dinghies and other apparatuses must be removed from the shoreline on or before November 15th, 2012. You gonna speak to this time? At the September 4th uh, uh, Park Board meeting, uh, the board discussed in detail the storage of diggings on pu uh, public property along the dike road. Uh, Municipal Code 181-12 was referenced, uh, noting that it does not allow boats to be parked on the shores of Lakefront Park and city property period of excess of four hours per day. It also states an over, uh, overnight parking. Uh, committee member Casanova, seconded by Alderperson T. Winkle to recommend staff provide a written letter to current uh, moors informing them that all dinghies and other apparatus shall be removed from the shoreline uh, no later than November 5th, <coughs> excuse me, 15th. The Park Board agreed that other options uh, for dinghy storage and access to the mooring area will be continued to be explored. So I'm just bringing that uh, from the Park Board. And if they're not removed by the 15th, uh, generally, happens? that's when the um, application permit application states that they should be removed by November 15th. What, what will I'm, I guess what I'm asking what will we as a city do if people decide to ignore that? I guess then we'd be our option to remove whatever is left over. Okay. Um, How many dinghies are out there, Tom? The last uh, I counted them about a week ago or two weeks ago was I think I counted 38. How many are being used? How many are accounted for? I mean, like, have an owner that is still has a mooring out there? Well, there's 49 mooring spots. Okay. So I don't know where the other 11 people or 12 that are um, <coughs> have their dinghies or part, you know, how they have access. Can I just add, we have no way of knowing that those dinghies that are there even belong to yeah. mooring. That's why I was asking. <laughs> like, um, so... You know, we don't we don't know who they belong to, really. They're supposed to have numbers. Some do, some don't. Uh, and I think I'll have to say that you know I wasn't uh, part of the uh, start of the dinghies and the mooring um, process, um, so I don't know exactly how the dinghies uh, got started on being on the dike. Um, just by looking at our uh, city codes, they talk about not having. Um, boats overnight, you know, with overnight parking over four hours. Um, so I'm not sure exactly when the dinghies started being there. That They don't mention dinghies in the uh, uh, Corps of Engineers permits. Most places reference 50 boats. Uh, I would assume that means the 50 sailboats. You know, if you add up the 50 dinghies and the 50 sailboats, uh, we're in violation of the Corps permit. Um, unless I miss something along the way. Um, I wasn't here at, the, you know, like I say, when this all started. It's okay. um, I'm sorry. So um, I feel that, it, you know, I would like to help uh, this situation. I have uh, spoken with uh, the 
Gordy Jarvis from the Afton Cruise Line. Um, you know, I think he's open to possibly increasing his dock sizes and maybe we could have something there, either have city-owned dinghies. I think that would be, you know, uh, permissible through the process and rent them or have some other kind of an agreement with them possibly. Um, I spoke with the Hudson Marina. They weren't too keen on the idea. They said there's a pri you know, they have a private marina there. The city uh, boat launch is still available. People with smaller boats could still launch from the shoreline. Um, so there are options. I think we should uh, consider some of those um, options. We have tried to get stair access. We've had a couple different um, plans in place. Uh, each one has, each plan we uh, came up with seemed like it had issues with it, uh, with the stairs. Um, most of the um, concerns that I have are with safety, get, just getting access down to those dinghies. Uh, if you've been down in that area, there's cables, there's chains, there's concrete, there's rebar, very dangerous. We've tried to explore the options of getting steps down to that area. Uh, it seemed to be very costly and we really couldn't come up with a good idea. Um, so safety is one issue. The other issue that we hear a lot about is um, just the, the, the look, everything is a little bit um, cluttered down there. There's uh, different styles of boats. There's canoes, there's uh, paddle, and not paddle boats, but there's um, dinghies, canoes, 14-foot um, fishing boats, 16-foot fishing boats. I mean, it's, uh, you can see every, you know, the things in the pictures. Um, so, like I said, this was a recommendation coming from the park board. Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, under the dinghy lease policy, um, aren't they allowed to launch their dinghies at no cost at the boat launch? Um, I don't I think it's a written policy. Discussion. Discussion. I don't believe that's in the ordinance. I don't think I that's... I talked with city staff and I think Liz thought that had been part of it, but I don't think she found any documentation. <coughs> okay. it, it's not stated right in their mooring because we talked about or that in our last policy. meeting. I thought there was some sense that that provision was in there. It can be checked. I mean, okay. but I, I think she wasn't able to document that. Because that would be something I would even be open to. I mean, obviously we want people to use the moorings. I know there's a waiting list most of the time for them. But, you know, I would like that to be part of their of their rental agreement if it's not. And I, I don't want to speak for the park board, but I would ask that we just consider that if it's not in their rental agreement. So we're gonna work with these people to try to get a procedure in place by next year so that there's some understanding of how we're gonna do this? Absolutely, in fact, I, you know, I've even tried to get that started already with you know the cruise line and other places. But whatever we can do to you know, resolve some of the issues. Okay. Did, did we have some comments? That We've people? got a few sailboat people here, and I think that we would like to maybe state our side yep. as well. Please come up and state your Absolutely. name. Absolutely. The sky is not falling. <laughs> uh, I've been a, a person, a sailboat <coughs> person. Can we have your name first? Jim Ostergaard. Jim Ostergaard. And your address? 6332 Applewood Court, St. Paul. Okay. Okay. The boat that I have is slip number 19. Yes, I have a dinghy out there. Yes, we do use the boat. There's lots of issues here. Namely, okay, what do we do with all the unsightly dinghies that are out there right now? Do any of you have a sailboat out there? Do you? Okay. Nope. If you had a sailboat, the reason you'd have one there is because you like to sail and you like easy, quick access to get out to your boat. How are you going to do that if you don't have a dinghy? Where are you going to launch the dinghy? Launch it at the public launch? Well, have you ever launched at that public launch? On a weekend, it fills up. There's no place to park. You can't even get in a lot. So, we got a problem there. Everybody that has a boat out there pays a certain amount of fees a year. 
And I believe that fee is $575. That's the source of revenue to the city of Hudson. What is that, 25 grand a year? Along with that should go the right to have a dinghy on the shoreline, to have the convenience of being able to get out to the boat. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose of really having a boat out there. Extending a dock, hmm, viable option potentially, but you'd have to work it out so it wouldn't be an added fee on top of what we're already paying. It's silly. This has gone on for, Tom can't remember. Tom's been here longer than I've been around. Tom stated that he can't remember exactly when the whole thing started. Now, the Corps of Engineers aren't gonna come down and lay the hammer out and say, gotta move those dinghies. It's not gonna happen. Realistically, the people need quick and easy access to get out to the dinghies. I'm one of those people. Safety, yeah, it's an issue. Crawling on those rocks, it's not the easiest thing to do. But, how many injuries have we had? Do we have any on record? The people out there are responsible. The boat owners are very careful. They're a kind, considerate group. Everyone I've come in contact with is very much a mature person that takes care of their boat and their dinghy. Now, granted, there are some that have been there for quite some time, which I believe are probably those that have been abandoned and should be removed. But the other thing to consider he mentioned that there's rebar and there's chains and all of that. Yes, there is. A lot of that mess, if you want to call it that, along the shoreline is, is stuff that floats up every year from the rise and fall of the water in the spring. And hence, that's part of the dilemma of the whole situation is there is no easy solution because the water goes up and down so dramatically that the dinghies have to be moved continually up and down. But that's a responsible boat owner's chore, if you want to call it that, to go out and maintain it to make sure it's done. So I don't know what's going to come out of this, but I think it's, 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 it's not the right choice to just say, hey, guess what? Effective November 15th, you got to have your dinghy out of there, which we do anyway. All the dinghies disappear, but come spring, I want, them in, I want an insurance that I can put my dinghy back out there and not have to worry about launching a boat to go to a boat. That defeats the purpose of having the moorings. This is revenue that's coming into the city. We can figure out a better solution. But to say no more just because I don't want to deal with it or because somebody doesn't like the way it looks out there, I would beg to differ. Because people come down that dike, they walk out there, and what do they see? They see those sailboats. And I've been out there quite a lot. And guess what you get? You get the banter with the people that are walking by and they say, oh, is that your sailboat out there? Or are you going out to one of the sailboats? And you can have a nice long conversation about sailing. And that's promoting the atmosphere of what you see out there. It's not diminishing it in any respect whatsoever. So again, the sky isn't falling. We just need to come up with a viable solution and that has to include allowing dinghies along that shoreline. Okay, okay. Thank, thanks Jim. My name is Robert Barbie, and I'm also a, a mooring holder. I live in New Richmond. Uh, I'm mooring holder number eight. And uh, that's so true. I mean, the sky isn't falling. Um, these sailboats have been here for many years under the DNR permitting that's been allowed. People with the DNR sail with me often. I'm sure that there's many solutions that can be worked out to the problem that's, that you're presented with. I think that, that taking a look at the problem. The problem is, is not that there's dinghies there, it's maybe the manner in which it's, it's, it's being looked at. Um, we, we need to have good access to the dinghies and I think that the mooring holders are perfectly willing to work something out. They're willing to work with the city uh, as the city sees fit. If the city wishes to have the park board work it out or, or the public engineer, public works engineer work it out, I'm sure that there's a solution. But I think that the whole solution needs to be addressed, not just eliminating the dinghies. If you have the dinghies removed by the 15th, that's only half the problem. The other half is what's gonna be in the spring. We need to have a solution for the spring. And I think by saying you're gonna eliminate the dinghies now, you're only creating a problem. Rather than taking advantage of these sailboats and the, the atmosphere that they do bring, and the business that they bring for the city of, 
of Hudson. I mean, I myself have spent probably oh, easily $1,500 in the last year downtown. That's 40 or 50, 50 mooring holders that you could have. That's about 50 to $75,000 per year for the businesses downtown. That's a good thing for the city of Hudson. I think that working with the mooring holders, I think there's a number of them that would come to meetings if that's the way you so chose to have it worked out. But I would ask that you solve the whole problem and not just make a problem for the mooring holders. And if the council wishes to do it by working out the problem themselves or directing the park board to solve the whole problem or the public works or some of the mooring holders, I think that we'd be open to that. And I'd ask that the council would not support what's on the floor today, but have it directed so that the whole solution is resolved. So you're suggesting that we could bring it back when we have a solution? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Kurt, do you want to say anything about, since you sit on park board, not to put you on the spot, but I'm curious what the general sentiment was. Well, the, the recommendation, I think, covers the sentiment quite well that the park board is definitely interested in finding a solution. Um, you know, we, we included the November 15th as a date that corresponds with the with the boats themselves coming out the sailboats um, I think the park board is very committed to finding a solution before next spring so I, I understand his his point of wanting the whole thing fixed um, the sentiment amongst the park board was to make sure that we alleviate the problem this fall and then tackle it over the winter mm -hmm. um, if I can just say that the ordinance that was mentioned is the same ordinance that you know applies to applied to the issues we've been facing all summer regarding uh, docks and boats and parking overnight and four-hour parking and I think if we're gonna stay consistent we need to stay consistent and I I know the president of the park board is here to, here tonight or the chair of the park board is here tonight and I'm sure that there's plenty of time, plenty of months in between November 15th and the launch of the, the new season to try and find a solution. I just think we need to stay, stay consistent with what we've been trying to do this whole time and, and, and follow our policy that's in the books. I mean, I mean, that was, you know, what was told, was mentioned in the, in the past meetings and that's, I think that's something that needs to be re, restated. So. I'm going to make a motion to remove the dinghies by November 15th, by the end of season, um, to not have them be uh, tied onto the dike road in the future, and to find an alternate, and to have the park board try and find an alternate solution to this problem. I would second that, and I guess I'd, um, I'd suggest to the park board too that. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought there was someone who wanted to speak. She, yeah, apparently she wants um, to say a word. That we consider the possibility of letting people launch their dinghies free of charge. You know, as mentioned, the gentleman from St. Paul, I didn't catch his first name. Yeah. Um, we've, we've instated a new policy at our boat launch this year with a great deal of thought, and I think it worked out fairly well. You are al allowed to launch your boat and leave the parking lot as long as you don't park an empty boat trailer on a city street. Um, so I would think for some of these dinghy owners, it would be possible to launch even if the parking lot's full and just go park their vehicle somewhere else. Um, so we're, we're trying to do this in a uh, thoughtful way, um, but it is part of a larger issue that we've been addressing as far as cleaning up the lakefront area and making sure that we don't have private property on the lakefront. I'm Pat Ostergaard, I'm the wife of the guy from St. Paul. Um, and the reason they had the free launching was so you could bring your dinghy there in the spring and then pick it up in the fall, not to use um, the launch every time you decided to sail, which might even be when a person has vacation two or three times a week. And for us to um, have friends, friends meet us in, um, in Hudson and go out to lunch and then go out in the boat, if we have to launch our dinghy and I can't park my trailer, anywhere on your streets, 
then what do I do? I have to have one of them drive me back to St. Paul and then shuttle me back here, and then when we're done, shuttle me back to St. Paul and get the trailer again to come back here to pick up my dinghy. I mean, it's kind of ludicrous. And if you look at other cities, what other cities has, have done that have moorings that they rent to people, White Bear Lake, Madison, Wisconsin, they all have a place for people to put their dinghies, and it's a part of their mooring contract. And I think it's very different for people to keep boats on public land and build docks on public land. Um, that's a very different issue than it is to rent a mooring spot for a sailboat and give that person um, the capability and the right to have a dinghy so they can access that, their sailboat. And what you might even do is call some other cities and see what their policies are and take a little survey of some of those cities to see what they do with their sailboat access and what they do with their dinghies and how they're stored. Um, because just because somebody who has a big boat and a big dock somewhere else violates a city rule doesn't give them the right to point at the sailboat dinghies and say, well, that's a private boat because we're renting a spot. They weren't renting a spot. <coughs> And to confuse the two issues, um, I think, is not the right thing to do. And to say, well, we'll try to solve the problem in March makes it very difficult because whenever the park board has met in the past, the sailboat owners haven't always even been invited. To this meeting tonight where you're talking about taking away the dinghies, I found out tonight when I opened my email that this was even on the city agenda. So the communication here between the sailboat um, owners and the people who lease all those mooring spots wasn't even communicated. Somebody found out it was on the city agenda and then they started emailing each other. So I would hope that if you want to say that the dinghies have to be gone so people don't take, let them sit there all winter long, I, I would totally agree with that. But I would say people get their dinghies back as part of their mooring contract, as part of their application in March, the way it is now. Because right now it says that the same number that's on your sailboat is supposed to be on your dinghy, because it's a part of the contract right now. And as far as the Corps of Engineers, they care about what's in the water. They don't care about what the city does with the city land. At least as far as I know. And I guess that's all I have to say. I, I really um, feel very badly about um, applying for my sailboat permit again, not knowing how far I'm going to have to row, if I'm going to have to bring my trailer every time. You know, it's a very, very big unknown for me. And that's not easy for me to car top a boat trailer, I mean, a, a dinghy on top. I mean, some somebody said, well, maybe and this was somebody from the city here, well, maybe people should use inflatables. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to blow them up, they're going to carry them down the dike, and they're going to crawl down the rocks. And then he said, well, maybe you should just launch it. And I guess I could get there at 6 o'clock, and all the sailboat owners will fill up your little parking lot where people try to launch their boats. And then he said, well, if it's a long way to row, maybe you should get a motor. And I said, well, that's kind of silly. Then I have to have a bigger boat because then it has to have the weight of the motor. And he said, oh, you can just buy a little two and a half horse. And I won't say who told me. I had a conversation with somebody today and that that's what their responses were. And what you want to have is just some little tiny boat to row out to your boat and you tie it up to your mooring and you sail. So. Fourth of July, too. What are we going to do there? Well, I, I appreciate the comments and we hear you. And um, I think the motion, Scott, you want to comment? Yeah, I just, thank you. No, I don't think it is. Mr. President, council members, thank you for hearing me. I'm Scott O'Malley, 1024 Third Street. I do not have a boat at the mooring. I did years ago. And uh, since there was some question about the history of this, I'll take 30 seconds to uh, let you know that back in those days, uh, prehistoric times perhaps, but uh, back in the 1980s, uh, not only did you get a place for your dinghy and a mooring for your boat, Danny, you probably remember this, you got a parking space on the Dyke Road reserved just for you. You had your own number, the same number that was on your boat, that was on your dinghy, 
was painted on the dike road. So you get a parking <coughs> space for free. That Well, not for free, you paid for it. Paid for it is the operative word here. And I'm going to ask you to do an unusual thing. I'm going to ask you to postpone action on the motion before you for two reasons. Uh, first of all, as has been amply pointed out, removing dinghies by November 15th is already covered by city ordinance. You, you don't need to redo that. It's already done. Secondly, um, unlike anything else you've had on the agenda this evening, unlike anything you almost ever have on your agenda, is that you're talking to paying customers who produce revenue for the city of Hudson. They give the city money. They take nothing that they don't pay for. And anything that you give them, they will pay for. That's the agreement under the DNR and Army Corps of Engineers agreement that any improvement you make, they will pay for. It costs the city absolutely nothing. There's been much talk earlier this evening about um, tax revenue of twenty-five dollars or $26,000 from the dog track, the former dog track. These people produce $28,000 in revenue every year for the city. It's not great, but it's better than nothing. And they pay for everything that you do. So I would suggest to you that perhaps you might consider not acting on this tonight. You don't have to do anything about the removal on November 15th. You can spend the winter talking over possible ideas. Tom Zuli and I worked out um, uh, dinghy dock situations, stairs that to improve safety, because everybody's right. Walking over that riprap that's down there, with chunks of broken concrete, rebar, sooner or later somebody's going to have an accident that's going to be a real problem. So we do need to address that. And I would suggest that this council has the brain power to do that. You can do that over the winter months, is address those issues, come up with a solution that suits you without doing anything to jeopardize the customer relationship you already have with all the people, those 50 moorings out there. Don't put them in question about whether or not they should re-up for next year because they don't know what the dinghy situation is going to be. Please treat them as you would any other customer. Postpone action tonight. Work on it over the winter. Come up with an agreeable solution in the summer. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Um, I believe I have a motion on the floor, correct? Yes. Um, I don't disagree with you, Scott, that the dinghies come out no matter what on November 15th. But, uh, that, but what the point of the, situ the situation at hand is that we have a policy on the books, and the policy is being broken. And I believe that was explained to me time and time again over the dock situation. I don't think it's a mix of the two situations. Bottom line, we have dinghies being tied to trees. We have someone who put uh, a pulley system in the ground with cement, okay? We have the dike road is, is cracking. We have chained dinghies on, attached to our dike road, which is supposed to be the, 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 t the tourist attraction, one of the main tourist you know, attractions to Hudson. With our, we have new, this isn't just a small situation. I understand that it's hard to roll out there. There is, there's been options in other cities such as dinghy houses. So maybe instead of having to build stairs to get down, maybe the money can be used to build a dinghy house somewhere on city property to store your dinghies so you don't have to worry about taking them back and forth to St. Paul. I don't know. I think that's something the park board needs to decide. But the bottom line is, as been pointed out time and time again, we have a policy on the books and the policy is being broken. So I will not change my motion. I'm choosing to stay consistent. Can you repeat the motion? Please? The motion was to, can you help me with that? I think I could. Remove the um, dinghies by November 15th and not have them tied to the dike road in the future. Also have the park board work on solutions over the winter. Can we? Uh, so you're, okay. So we're saying, I just want to understand it so I know which way to vote. Um, so we're saying they can't be attached to the dike road, but we want the park board to look at other options yes. other than that attaching them as they are. Yes. Can, can, uh, can I make a suggestion? Here? Can we put a date on the solution so that by sure. the time they renew the mooring fees, they'll have when did they renew the mooring fees in March? Going to be? Tom, would that be acceptable to the park board? When did they renew their mooring? No later than March 1st of each year. Right. Okay, so the first meeting in February, bring it back to council. <clears throat> so can we? Uh, Tom, are you comfortable with committing to something like a com I would be glad to meet with the Moors and, and whoever and try to come up with some, uh, some solutions. I'd be glad to do that if we have to have special meetings or, or whatever, if we have to get it done. So, so we'll, if, we'll make if, it, yeah. if we don't feel a month is enough time, I'll, I'll say January, but I just want to give Tom enough time to yeah. find a solution too. So yeah. I think first meeting in February is 
we have another meeting after that to before March 1st. Okay. I guess as long as we put a deadline on it that is so suitable. I'll add that to my motion okay. to have a solution brought back to council by first meeting in February. Okay. You know, but that, that's fine. I agree with what you're saying on consistency on the policy, but but Scott makes sense that it's actually in our boat mooring, boat mooring policy under uh, uh, 181 chapter 181 D1, November 15th. I guess what are we trying to accomplish here? They're going to be done April 15th. They know our intent. Let's assure them we come up with a policy and let them have that. Uh, and let's go from there. Yep, just given, just affirming the end date. Is that okay with the sailboat people? If I could speak again, if there was if there was a policy right now, for example, that we all had to have identical uh, identical dinghies, if that was a solution you decided on tonight, then we could say yes, it's fine. But the trouble is, is you want us to renew shortly, and we don't have we don't know what it is. What is that solution? Is it a five hundred dollar solution, or is it a hundred thousand dollar solution I was here about what two three months ago talking to the council and the park board about some of the ways that the city of New Richmond might take a look at this and rather than see this as a problem work as recreational boarders how you can encourage greater use of the river and encourage more people to spend money in the downtown Hudson and I think that's approach that the Hudson the city council would like to see well, would benefit the city of, of Hudson and might be a way that you might look at this and try to encourage whether it be public works, the park board, or whomever to take a more proactive uh, interest in solving the problem. If you want all identical dinghies, that's a solution that we could, that we could, you could by policy implement. But the trouble is, is right now you're not implementing a change that we know what it is. It's other than you can't have your boats, you, you've got a problem. It's only half of the problem. And that's why I ask that, respectfully ask that this be tabled at this time. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, yeah, this brings a point to light that the, I think there's just been so much miscommunication with this issue and that over the years that you come back and forth with stairs, Tom, and the idea of doing that and this, there's been no single representation of the Mooring Club. And this issue is directly related to there's no communication going either way. So maybe this mooring they've got to develop an association or a lead spokesman to come to these meetings and give us one opinion of the whole group so we can actually make informed decisions as well paul did paul rodemacher chairman of the, uh, the park board 1415 boulder court uh, president vanslow and council members uh, We've been working on this issue for many years, and we've had various meetings with uh, the people who use the moors, mooring units, and and so forth. And we're very close to, I think, some some recommendations. Uh, the point of the motion is to uh, we've come to the conclusion that having the uh, um, dinghies affixed to the dike road is no longer an option, and so that's that's why. We would like to have the uh, dinghies allowed to finish out their season, you know, have them there for the finish out the season, but from that point forward, no longer have them tied to the dike road. We believe there are some options available. Uh, you've heard the concerns of some of the some of the people here tonight, which are very valid, and we believe me, we know that we understand their concerns, and uh, we'll we'll have some recommendations. It's on uh, forthcoming to you hopefully shortly within the next uh, two to three months, if not sooner. Uh, it is on the next uh, park board agenda meeting to uh, and we'll continue to have it on the park board agenda meetings until we can have a solution or two or three to present to you um, in, the, in the near future. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. So the motion is making it clear that we're enforcing our policy of November 15th. Is that well, no, well, that's already been enforced. Obviously, it's policy. What the motion is also saying is that we will no longer allow dinghies to be tied to the dike road. It is a private that is a private boat being tied to public property. After this season. After this season. And to have the park board get back to the council with sufficient enough time with a resolution to this problem so that we can have the mooring uh, group have their, have, have a, uh, an, an idea of what they're gonna be able to do with their dinghies. Well, Paul, Paul alluded to it and, and you know, as, as a member of the park board, you know, I'll give my commitment that we'll, we'll do everything that we can 
in a timely fashion to give as much time as possible to whatever suggestion we come back with. The only reason I'm, I, I hear the arguments and I know Park Board made the recommendation that they not be tied to the dike road. I'm probably gonna vote against the motion just because I want, I want the Park Board to have all options on the table, whatever they might be, and I'm afraid that the motion might limit that. So I, I'm could, okay with the November 15th. Could, whatever the policy is, if you approve that policy, it would supersede your motion this evening. So if their policy okay. was they can be tied to the deck road. I know, but if the direction that we're giving to the park board is and we don't want anything on deck road, then they're not going to include that as part of their, so. As well as it shouldn't be on deck road, that's why I made the motion like that. That's a public road and these are private boats. Right. Same thing as what occurred two months ago. But won't we be solving the problem? We let the policy take its effect November 15th, and then if we delay this tonight on action, we can discuss with hopefully a, a remedy for the situation. But there's nowhere in my motion does it, does it hinder anything. It, it's letting them sail out the sailing season. It's asking them to, which, they, which they'll be able to do. They'll have to remove their dinghies, which apparently they already do. Anyone who still own, is using those dinghies, and obviously there's abandoned dinghies, and it's just stating no longer can we tie dinghies to the dike road, period. And the park board should be able to come back with a recommendation. It's a very clear, clean, clear motion. It's, I think it's the right thing to do. I think if we feel that it's okay to tie dinghies to our dike road, then we really need to start looking at our policy and how we're following them. Because we're starting to follow them one way for one situation and another way for another situation. That's, I think this is a very clean cut motion. It is not saying, we're not allowing them to have something on city property. Maybe they, maybe, maybe we'll have a garage that opens where they can store their dinghies. I don't know. I'm just saying that the dike road should be off limits for the storage of dinghies. I don't think that's. I stand with my motion. So there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second for the motion? There was a second already. I was? Think. Did you already second? Yeah, but I didn't get um, Lori's approval to about the amended part of the motion to bring it back to council on, at the first meeting. In I February. want to bring it back to council, but I think I'm going to withdraw my second, if I may. I don't think you can. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> yeah. I wanted, I want them off on November 15th and I wanted to go to park board for a further review. I'll second. John second. seconding Mary's. Second. Mary's. I'm not seconding Mary's. Okay. All right, there is a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. No. So two no's and four yeses. Motion carries. And we will get a solution. All right, consider adoption of the Burton Park Conceptual Plan as the Master Park Plan. Is pretty closely tied to it. Thomas? Tom. Tom, you want to address this? Tom? Tom. Tom, you want to address this park plan? The, the park, park plan? plan? Oh, we had something left. Burton uh, Park uh, conceptual plan was uh, presented to the park board and uh, they felt that uh, this was a plan that they would like to move forward with and make this the master plan uh, as we move forward with the uh, Burton Field renovation. <coughs> uh, so I'd like to just present this to the council and have them consider that to uh, use this plan and as a master plan for uh, Burton Field. This is open to add-ons or what are you thinking? Add-ons, uh, deletions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm sure there always can be some modifications, if that, that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the way that uh, the park board would like to see, see it, the direction that we'd like to see Burton Field go as we have funds available. And, and the funds will come strictly from impact fees. 
Or are they going to come out of our capital budget? Up to, yeah, up to the we council. can make a request. I don't well, know. I just if don't know. Happen. Okay, I should. I guess I should ask it like this: Do we have impact, enough impact fees for for this total for this project? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> no. no the discussion uh, has taken place that this is long term, <clears throat> at best. Yeah. Currently, How we long? just currently we just have the uh, playground uh, equipment approved, and that installation will be done within the next few weeks. That was uh, phase one. Um, as we get donations, impact fee monies, capital monies, if we get them, then, then we'd move forward. But uh, uh, this is probably, like um, Kurt said, a long range plan for Burton Field. But we'd like to have this set so we can know what direction to go. As we move into phase two, as monies come available, that we'll know that this is accepted as a master plan. and. If the next phase, we, we know where we can go. So we're just approved. You're asking just for the approval of the plan. Yeah. And we're not I, talking about okay. And I know we did take a um, just for a little information. We did a local survey, online survey. Uh, we took uh, talked to the different school districts around the area. Uh, a lot of people said that um, the ball field was very important. Uh, we changed the two fields into one for safety reasons. The hockey rink and the ice skating rink were uh, one of the things that were uh, very important to the city residents along with the neighborhood. The playground, which we're addressing right now, was very important. Uh, it's been a park that's been neglected. Uh, with this plan, we've addressed other concerns with the sidewalk being added onto the inside of the park for safety reasons. We've added diagonal parking along 10th Street to keep that, you know, keep people away from 9th Street, which is and 9th and St. Croix, which is um, the busier streets. We've added a rain garden for um, uh, stormwater uh, retention. Also, we're just uh, something that uh, we'd like to um, an option for is we have a drop-off area on Oak Street. We'd like to maybe consider that a one-way street where the people could drive in drop the kids off in that uh, drop-off area and then continue forward. So I think it's a really good plan. It's something that you know is gonna, might take a long time, but uh, we've started with phase one and I think overall the park board approved it and uh, seemed like the local residents, the people that were representing the uh, school uh, moms group really liked it. So I hope that we can adapt this and use this as a uh, model for our, our plan. No, it's well thought out. I was just, it's a very nice plan. It's well thought out. I was just wanting to clarification as to tonight's purpose. So. So this does not commit. I know. I, I understand that. I just, the line, the line, the line defining the outfield is not a fence, is it? It's just a line on this paper. Uh, we didn't talk about a fence yet. Okay. I don't I, think, I don't, well, it'd be hard to have a fence right in the middle where the skating rink is. So yeah, no, I it's I, we're I just going to be open grass. Yeah. Okay. This field here would be more of a, a little league field for younger children and, and a softball field. Okay. I'll move we adopt the uh, Burton Park conceptual plan for the Burton Park master plan. Second that. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. All right, unfinished business, uh, nothing, update on projects, update on projects from Karen. Boy, we've had you here all night. <laughs> um, we'll even update this sheet from what was submitted. I've been informed by Tom that the street maintenance project has started, and they have completed all the work except uh, St. Croix Street. They will be doing those uh, flex patching on uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. So otherwise, all the other streets have had the maintenance done to them. The street improvement project, I think it's going really well. Carmichael Road is complete. Uh, Grandview Drive is still being worked on, and they're slowly removing the material that's there and placing gravel. That should be completed. The gravel placement should be completed by the end of the week. And next week is <coughs> when the residents are really going to be inconvenienced because we're going to be putting down curb and gutter probably around September 27th, sometime during that week. Do we have a projected end date for Grandview? Uh, I believe it was oct near the end of October, but they'll be completing it before that. Weather pending, yeah, right. for weather, yeah. Yep, weather permitting. 
Karen, real quick, does that crack sealing uh, toilet paper or whatever you call it dissipate in the rain? Because there's fly, it's flying all over a crest here. You know, yeah, so. It generally does with the rain. You know, we just haven't had any fun. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the alley, they'll start working on the alley the week of September 24th. Right now, there hasn't been any work on the alley. Uh, Uline, they relocated some hydrants out on Uline because of the change in the, the site plan. They've completed the testing on the water main that connects up to Heiser Street. And then on Procentive, all the utilities have been installed. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. All right, uh, old business, there's nothing there. New business, amendment to chapter 242-9 of the missile, miss, new, 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 yeah, that code, <laughs> well abandonment and well operation permit, ordinance number 1112. Both of these are coming from the Water Utility Board. I believe there are updates to them to bring them in compliance with the current state law. That's correct. Yeah, DNR requires this. So they're just updating what's in there. So we need to suspend? Yeah. Well, what are we abandoning? Um, there are well, 10 or 8? No, uh, these are no, personal, private wells. Private oh, wells. Oh, oh, oh. Basically stating that you can, Hudson, City of Hudson does not really allow private wells anymore, even if you have. Right. At one point you could use them for irrigation, but we, we mostly just hook up to water now yeah. and don't allow that. In North yeah. Hudson, you can actually do it. You can actually have a private well and be on city water. I move to suspend the rules. Okay. Second. <clears throat> Bernard? Yes. Morissette? Yes. Yakub? Yes. Hoggett? Yes. Vanslow? Yes. T. Winkle? Yes. Motion to adopt ordinance uh, number 11-12. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Amendment to Chapter 242-10 of the Municipal Code Cross-Connection Control and Backflow Prevention, Ordinance Number 12-12. It's another maintenance type thing. Yeah, it's also an update. Uh, a previous um, ordinance had was very, very, very limited. Um, these are helped and drafted by DNR, represents, representatives of DNR, and have uh, been reviewed by council, I believe. So I, uh, I would have moved to approve. I need, I need to suspend. I need to move to suspend the rules. Second. <laughs> Morissette? Yes. Yakub? Yes. Hoggett? Yes. Banso? Yes. T. Winkle? Yes. Bernard? Yes. I would move to approve amending um, Hudson Municipal Code Chapter 242 10, Cross Connection Control and Backflow Prevention. Second that. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Communications and recommendations of the mayor. There is a reappointment of Tom Irwin to the Public Utility Commission. Any discussion regarding the appointment of Tom? Move to approve the appointment. Second. Motion and a second to reappoint Tom Irwin. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The quarterly reports. Uh, Communications and items for future agendas. Any other person? No, I just uh, remind everyone we have moved our public works meeting to this Wednesday at 6 p.m. We're mainly going to be discussing, it's our monthly meeting, but we're also going to be focusing on um, budget issues, trying to find areas where we can make some cuts. And so I'd welcome the public to that discussion. I would just like to thank all of the council members for their conduct and their work the work and I know of the amount of work that went into tonight's agenda and to make it a very respectful type meeting for everyone with a difficult subject on the agenda so thank you very much for your efforts move to adjourn second all those in favor aye, aye. opposed adjourn <laughs> <laughs>